Okay, there's a bit of a project for the day. Um, I've recently acquired an old analog computer built by Heathkit. Um, I think it appeared around 1959. And in Chuck Penson's excellent book, Heathkit Test Equipment Products, which I've referenced in many of my other videos, he does have a chapter on the computers, probably because they are kind of like test equipment in some ways. And Heathkit made an ES series computer, which was kind of a big bruiser. Um, this is a picture of it. And then they uh, later on made the much more compact, the EC1. These were both intended for educational purposes. Analog computers were a very real thing at that time because they were pre-digital computers. Um, if you had a computer, it was probably an analog computer, except for, of course, purely mechanical computers or hydraulic computers. Those existed as well. Anyway, these were, uh, especially the EC1, were quite popular with colleges and universities um, in teaching engineers how to program analog computers because they might well encounter them once they leave school. Anyway, I have one of these. I'm starting to get things together to do a restoration on it, but one of the things that's missing are the personality modules. The computer is not complete without the personality modules. And uh, they're uh, little modules which plug in. Let's see. You can see these kind of white-looking connectors on the front of the computer and uh, those were for a proprietary uh, module that could have various passive components for example resistors and capacitors installed on them or potentiometers or perhaps even other things uh, and that would change each of the nine op amps that's in here vacuum tube op amps it would change them into a particular type of op amp circuit one example of that would be an integrator uh, so um, in order for this to be functional, I need to fabricate a bunch of patch cords for it to interconnect all the modules and also uh, produce a number of the uh, little personality modules for each of the op amps. Heathkit uh, provided the parts to build 27 of them. And I've already purchased the necessary passive components to build them, and I've designed a small circuit board which will go in here because I can't source the original parts. And uh, let's see, where did I put that? Oh yeah, here it is. This is the actual size printout from the software. And it's pretty simple. Um, a set of pins are soldered onto these large pads, and those will be what plug into the sockets on the front panel and then a little um, screw type terminal block will go on the other end of the circuit board for connecting the external components. So in that sense the circuit board is basically just a pin socket to screw terminal board adapter. But in addition to that you need to have a way to connect potentiometers. The original modules you would just put wires into a potentiometer and then stick those in the screw terminals. I decided to go one step better and I've got some little potentiometers that will go into these holes here with the terminal removed then the shaft will stick out in that direction and can be adjusted and then using some little jumpers like this I can put two three pin shunt strips on there and then put the little plug on shunts on them and by doing that I can program the pot to react with a increasing resistance on either uh, well I should rephrase that I can program it to increase or decrease resistance on uh, clockwise rotation and uh, so it'll have that flexibility 
And the one thing I really still need to do, I have these circuit boards on order, um, I need to make the pins. So that's the subject of this video. Oh, by the way, <laughs> I had my worksheet here where I was trying to figure out what I was going to put on there and how it was going to be connected. I was trying out different things, working out dimensions and so on. Um, and one concern is I was looking through the manual for the EC1 and it looks like normally you've got voltages up to around 100 volts DC uh, that you'll normally be working with on it. Although the power supplies go up higher, um, unless you're directly connecting to the power supplies, it shouldn't go that high. But it could get upwards of 200 volts, maybe a bit less, worst case. And then the normal power supplies are more like plus and minus 60 volts, so say around 120 volts if you were to connect between them. So I decided, well, I'm going to set this up to be safe in operation for 200 volts uh, so that nothing will arc over or anything if you applied 200 volts across the pins. So I had to make sure I selected a potentiometer whose pins were still according to the, um, I forget what it is now, the uh, according to the IPC2221 guideline that's widely used for circuit board design, um, I figured I would have about a 1.4 millimeter minimum spacing between things on the board, and that's primarily in the area of the pot and the the programming jumpers. And that should give me um, around 200 volts of safe uh, operation. And I could increase that by painting over that area of the circuit board uh, on the uh, on the side with the foils. I have more spacing with just the pads, but the foils cut into that a little bit. I can paint over with an insulating liquid, which, which, which when dried will act like a silk screen or a, a solder mask, more specifically, and that would increase the the dielectric of that even some more. So it should be good. And there's my scale sheet uh, that I used before plugging this into the software, just trying to work out the spacing of things. And uh, these pins here are the same size as they would be on an octal vacuum tube or a octal relay base, um, so the same diameter, it's uh, 3 30 seconds inch diameter. And um, I've got some big flats on the circuit board as already mentioned, onto which to solder those pins so there's a lot of surface area and hopefully a good adhesion to the circuit board that it doesn't just peel the foils off the board if there's any resistance applied to these pins. That's physical resistance or force applied to them. And uh, while the pins will be sweat soldered to the pads, I need to round the ends of the pins and also put a flat on each of the pins for this section of it so instead of these just rolling around on the board before soldering it, they'll lay flat on the board and I can position them more accurately. I'm also going to fabricate a jig to hold the pins in exact spacing and alignment uh, during the soldering process. There's a side view of the pins I need to make. There's the flatted area there and the other end rounded. There's the uh, EC1 laying in pieces in my storage room. Turn the video that way. So it's these plugs here that we're talking about. Heathkit had a couple of different paint schemes for the EC1. One with a darker complexion and light colored sockets and this lighter complexion and dark colored sockets. I think this is probably the later version. Um, this, these sockets are intended for a particular type of crystal that used to be pluggable in old radios. And here's an example of one of the crystals which I bought off of eBay to verify the pin size and length and spacing. Um, and uh, 
I can't actually plug this in here because it's too wide to go between the banana posts, but I can plug it in sideways and verify that that's the appropriate length of pin for it to go all the way into the socket. So the, this is my model here for what I need to make. Of course, this is just the part of it that would stick out past the circuit board. I still need to have the part that solders to the circuit board. And full disclosure, um, this is an experimental pin I made using the same process I'm going to make. Um, made it out of some 3 seconds inch diameter brass rod. I machined a little flat on the end. It's not going to show up very well in the video. And I've got a blob of solder on there to verify that it would solder. I have it nickel plated, or not nickel plated, tin plated. You can see the solder there a little better on the flat. So I just did that to make sure that my process was verifiable and that it was all going to work out. So it's a proof of concept. Alright, I've got these two two foot long brass rods. They call this the machinable brass or ultra machinable brass or something like that. It's one of the different alloys they have. It's supposed to be the one that's better for machining and that's what I want. So that's what I got. These are 3 seconds inch diameter. Together they make four feet which is I calculated that if everything goes perfectly I need three and three quarters foot so I've got enough room here to make a few slops. Uh, so I'll start by cutting these all into the necessary lengths which is 11 sixteenths long each and 60 of those. Alright, I'm going to use my very rusty bandsaw for this. I think I may run it up against some wood first to get some of that rust off. Okay, well, somehow that seems to have only added up to 54 of them between the two rods, and it should have made 60. So I'm a couple short, but I may have miscounted. Well, um, after taking into account, of course, the uh, handful of them that I made, some off camera, just to get the jigs dialed in, the ones that are the appropriate length and not uh, overcut in regards to the flat. I have enough virgin blanks here to, 
um, to count up to 54, which is actually enough, um, just exactly barely, but I ordered 30 circuit boards, so I really should have 60 pins. So the rod's cheap enough, I'm going to order another 2 foot length from McMaster Carr, and I will make the other ones so that every board has its own pins. That's just cleaning up the uh, raw edges from the uh, sawing. And now I spin them at an angle on the sander to put that tapered point on them. Since I've gone through and tapered all the pins I've cut so far, I made them all a little long when I cut them, and not incredibly consistently so. So I've got this block of wood with a hole drilled in it, and if I put the pin in it, a little bit sticks out, and I'll use the belt sander to take it down till just before the wood touches the uh, sanding belt, and then it'll be the right length. right at the proper length now. That works well. I just have to do a very light kiss on the end of it just to remove a little burring from the sanding. Alright, there are 54 of the pins tapered on one end sanded to length at the other end and all they await is the milling operation as far as the machining goes but I'm not going to go any further until I get the other six made and for that I have to place an order with McMaster Car. I usually get their things in the next day so it'll be a couple days from now before I can continue Pushing the pin through the vise until it hits the spacing block. Tightening the vise. Bringing the bit close to the workpiece. Making sure that I'm at a good vertical position. out, inspect it, looks good. Hard to get a good picture of it. Anyway.
last one. Finally. All right, 60 pins plus six spares. I have two additional pins, ones, ones which I made that were too short, so they're rejects. This one has been gently cleaned with a bit of Scotch-Brite pad. The other one has not. They've both been given a quick wipe down with isopropyl alcohol. And now I'm going to do a plating test. I'm going to try using the uh, MG Chemicals 421A liquid tin product that I successfully use with my homemade printed circuit boards. Uh, I did contact MG Chemicals and asked if this would work on brass as opposed to copper. And they said, you know, there might be some variations due to the alloy and some other factors, but that they thought it would achieve the necessary reaction or whatever to um, to do the plating. And I did do a test, as I may have mentioned before, on this just rough piece uh, that did take on the plating. But uh, now for these particular parts, I'm going to compare the slightly scuffed up one to the uh, one that's simply cleaned in alcohol. Gonna let it go for 10 minutes, occasionally rolling these around a little bit so it's not maybe always the same place exactly on the flat. Um, what I did with the other ones was these always want to roll back to the heaviest side down. So I just used a piece of wood about every 30 seconds to kind of, that was, wasn't the one I used. Or maybe it was a pencil. I used something just to change the angle of the tank so that they would roll with a different side down, but that would allow the part they'd been sitting on to get slightly better exposure. I'm not sure it really makes a difference. Okay, there are the two plated pins. The one with the dot on the flat is the one that was slightly buffed up. It has a uh, duller finish. I don't know if the camera picks it up, but this one's definitely a bit shinier. It seems like it got a good enough finish on it. On the other hand, uh, this one might benefit from a slight buffing. Let's see. So there's the one that was buffed after just going over it very quick and light with the Scotch-Brite pad again. So it's capable of shining up just like the other one. Okay, just my cheap basement shop. Multimeter, I'm getting probes crossed about one ohm floating around. Certainly no problem with conductivity. And the test on this bigger uh, first off one showed that I could solder to it just fine. So I think all I need to do with all of these is just give them their uh, quick once over with isopropyl. I don't need to buff them. All wiped down with isopropyl alcohol. Alright, they're all in the liquid tin solution. I'm going to find some sort of a plastic thing to stick in there and agitate them a bit. Not sure what I'm going to use. I'm going to use the tip of this uh, pen.
these things love to roll up next to each other and touch that seems to be their happiest position all right all the pins are out of the tinning solution and rinsed and dried and they're out for additional drying just in case they've got some little spots of water on them somewhere they look like they came out okay slightly dull not real shiny but then neither are the pins on vacuum tubes and relay sockets typically or relays like octo relays the pins okay my circuit boards have come in I've got um, three piles of ten so the thirty boards I'd ordered and uh, they seem to be exactly what I expected there's my proof of concept printout it's just the same so I'm gonna try building a couple of these up with the um, bag o pins that I made and uh, the main concern I have is trying to keep the pin alignment I had included these little bumps on the large solder pads for the pins to help align on one end and then I bought a couple of these uh, new old stock ceramic fuse sockets which are intended for the same size and spacing of pins to help hold them in position as well alright well I have sloppily soldered the first set of pins on um, and it did work do it on camera here here's the socket they plug in they come off they seem to be reasonably tight on there as I figured they would there's enough surface area there to get enough solder wetting that um, it should hold on and the reason I put these uh, four holes in the corner of each pad is because the pads only on one side and I'm using those kind of like uh, anchors to help secure that pad from lifting off the board if it gets you know enough stress on it that I want to just peeling the foil off the board so I figured having these pads on the other side and then the plated through holes which um, on future ones I'm going to solder through first to increase their strength I did not do that on this first one although some of them got solder in it anyway these aren't as straight as I'd like I was mucking around with different ways of doing this I wasn't sure how hard it would actually be I had thought I would use my spring-loaded tweezers to kind of hold them in place but those turned out to not have enough contact area and the pins were able to freely swivel around so I think what I'm going to end up doing is making a wooden jig to hold the pins and the board in exact position and then solder them in there but that'll be a job for another day okay I want to make a jig as simply and quickly as possible to hold this board steady and in alignment with two pins while I solder them so something obviously needs to hold the pins in reasonable alignment the sockets have some level of forgiveness that they'll allow some tolerance to misalignment but I want them to be pretty accurate so I think what I need to do here is um, make a block of wood with a couple holes drilled in it these pins are very close to the same depth 
or length, but they're not exactly the same. Um, so I think probably what I'll end up having to do is uh, put them in there and then adjust them to get the right length so they both line up with the flats on them lining up with the edge of the circuit board. I did think about making it more like two troughs that they would sit in, making the positioning them a little easier while still maintaining the alignment. I may still do it that way. In other words, I could make a block with the two holes and cut it in half and make that like a pillow block type of arrangement. That might work out okay. Uh, and then the uh, I'd have to put a screw through from the top just to clamp the whole thing down. And then I need a block with a uh, recess in it to hold the board in place and be able to clamp it down along the edges. Uh, and that'll be the essence of it, I think. I have my little pillow block made out of hardwood here. I drilled them a little high on the line deliberately. It's not precision work. All right, I have my pillow block here. The hole drilled in the center and a block to go on the top so I can put in these guys like this 
and then put that on top and drop this 832 screw through the close clearance hole. The screw will actually go into the piece of wood below and screw into that and it passes through with just tight clearance on the other two blocks so they stay in alignment and the two pins are pinched in there so they won't slide. The center to center spacing is still a half inch. So that's a good first step. Now that I know the dimensions of that piece I can make the block to hold the circuit board. This is oak here that I'm making this whole thing out of because I don't think pine will um, <clears throat> hold up over the 30 iterations. So I'm using a somewhat harder wood here, but I don't have anything thicker than whatever that is. So I have to make this block up to get a, a larger chunk. Alright, now I just have to wait for that to set up.
Okay, there's the block. Looks like it just came out of one piece of wood originally. Okay, the board is in its channel and the two screws can be clamped down to overlap the board slightly. Um, the left one there just barely touches it. I may have to use a small washer with that. Um, and the board can be adjusted this way. Okay, after some tweaking, I put a long stiff wire through the block there, the pillow block, to more easier, more readily or just easier steer the angle of the pins to the circuit board once the screw is tightened down. I would find that it would get a little bit off and then the pins would be going in slightly that way so I could straighten them out by tweaking this using the leverage to overcome the stick friction here. Um, I had to back shim this top block uh, because I really should have put the screw further this way instead of centered uh, so I'm forcing it to be more level with this shim. I have uh, I think two layers of cardboard shim and two or three pieces of post-it note stuck in there to um, bring that up to just the right height and I did have to move this screw so that it gets a better purchase on the circuit board but it does seem like everything's lining up now so I'll have to try it out and see how it works. Okay, I've got all the parts here. It worked out pretty well. There's still a little bit of futzing around, but I think after I do a few more, I'll have more or less perfected the technique of getting these in and out of there with as little mess as possible. Okay, let's do one on camera. So I've got my shims in there. They really should be glued down or something, but uh, I have to reposition them after every board or before every board. So I make sure I have that in there the right way. I put it in between the screws. I have a alignment mark to show how far I put it in there. and then push it against the side of the channel it's in. There's just a slight amount of play there. To make sure it's straight and then snug down the 
circuit board tensioning screws. Verify everything looks good. Now I grab a couple of the the pins. <clears throat> On each side of the flat I grab the end of the pin with the screwdriver and find the uh, channel in the pillow block push the pins in further than they need to go at this stage that's all that I need Alright, now that the pins are in the pillow box, I can snug this block down just a little bit, just so the pins are have a good stick friction on them, but now I have to adjust them for length. They're in too far. First I check to make sure they're not rotated, and they are, so they're not so tight that I can't grab them and rotate them with the needle nose pliers. There we go. And um, then I use my two outriggers here to steer the pins so they line up most centered with their pads and then pull the uh, pins out until they click when the end of the flat hits the end of the circuit board essentially and that's also when the end of the pin reaches the end of the square pad it's the same thing recheck for alignment it looks like it's a little bit off That looks about right. Tighten the screw a little bit more. These pins don't have that much thermal mass, neither does the circuit board, so it only takes a few seconds of the iron on there. I do a couple of tests to see when the solder starts flowing on the plated pins, and then I just flood the whole area with solder. There it's starting to flow. All right. Now I use my duster to blow some cold gas on it. that cools it down enough that it's not going to um, have the pins come loose when I start loosening up the clamps. And I pull the board out. Now I can take my uh, crystal socket and do a test. Make sure it goes in there nice and it's done. At least this part of it. Once I get all 30 boards done as far as the pins go then I can start putting the other components on. Alright, this thing did good work. I got pretty speedy with its use and uh, it worked out very well. I was able to knock these 30 boards out pretty quickly as far as getting the pins on them. Now I'll go and put all the green connectors on and then on six of the boards I'll put the shunt strips 
and the potentiometers. All right, all of the potentiometer modules have been assembled now. I just got them marked with a sharpie as to which resistance they are. I don't know if the 1Ks will ever come in handy, but I decided to make a couple of them anyway. These are 500Ks here, and these are 50Ks. Two of each. Uh, the way the jumpers work out, I have it mapped out here. Uh, if you've got the uh, pins numbered 1 and 2, one always goes to the wiper of the pot. That doesn't have anything to do with the jumpers. It's just hardwired on the circuit board traces. So with the pot being here and the two sets of jumpers here, if the rear one is on the left, then you have this configuration. You have a rheostat with one going to the wiper and the counterclockwise going to two. If you move the jumper to the right side, the rear jumper to the right side, I should say, one still goes to the wiper, the clockwise goes to two. In both cases, the opposite side is left open, so it's a rheostat wiring instead of a potentiometer wiring. Now, if you want to engage the opposite end, uh, for example, this way, where... Uh, it's still operating as a rheostat, but the sort of unused end of the, the pot element is connected to the wiper. Uh, then you'd still have the rear jumper in the same place, but you always have the front jumper in the opposite position. Same thing for uh, 1 to 2 being uh, to the clockwise side with the counterclockwise uh, jumper to 1. And if for some reason you want to have this plugged in but don't want to have it have the potentiometer engage for some reason, then just putting both jumpers on on the same side, right or left, shorts out the pins one and two, and the pot doesn't do anything. That's about as flexible as I could make it. And these pots are small pots, so that when you put them one next to each other on the different op amp modules of the EC1 they don't hit the next one over. Okay all of these things are done now and I'm gonna do one more sanity check just plugging a couple of them into the front of the EC1 All right, those all plug in just fine. The pots are the spacing that I intended. All right, um, I'm just gonna tack this on to the end of the EC1 module video. Um, my EC1 came without the patch cords as well as being absent any of the modules. Uh, so I'm going to build them according to the Heathkit specifications. I have a roll of um, Pomona silicone rubber test lead wire. Fairly premium stuff and probably not too dissimilar to what Heathkit would have originally supplied as well as a big pile of Pomona banana um, plugs of the stacking kind. I think the original Heathkit ones were not stacking, but uh, Pomona only has the stacking kind now. There's the uh, Pomona um, part number 6733-2 for the test leads. And there is the um, 1325-2 banana uh, plug solderless solderless <laughs>
the Heath kit manual stipulates that there should be six cables that are only six inches long, twelve that are twelve inches long, and six that are eighteen inches long. These use um, side entry for the wire to allow stacking from the rear and they come from Pomona with the set screw loose and you basically just um, drop it in the back stick a screwdriver in there and uh, turn it until I start seeing it enter the hole there because the uh, wires aren't coming straight out the back I'm increasing the length in other words um, Heathkit intended them to come out the back like this and then you might have a six inch uh, lead but when I'm coming in the side like that it adds whatever that is about an inch and a half uh, to each end that is kind of wasted length as far as what Heathkit intended so for a six inch I am actually going to use a nine inch the wire gets stripped and the strands twisted this is a high strand count wire which uh, along with the silicone rubber insulation makes for a nice floppy very flexible Tesla the way you want them to be not the uh, kinda stiff kind you get from the uh, the cheaper PVC insulated and there we have a test lead that appears to be eight inches long but by the time you subtract an inch on each end to do that it's essentially a six inch long now I just have to make a bunch more of these alright six of the six inches are done and a dozen 12 inches and there are the six 18 inches and that shows that uh, these cables are plenty long enough to reach within the um, size of the front panel